The Assemblies of God is one of the world's largest and most extremist fundamentalist Christian organizations in existence. And coming out of this group can have a really major psychologically damaging impact on people. I grew up in the Assemblies of God. I spent the first 28 years of my life in this denomination and became a licensed minister and ministered in the Assemblies of God. I also almost became a missionary to India. I did several short-term missionary trips there. So I know this group pretty intimately. And I want to say that I don't have an axe to grind here against the people in this organization. I think that there are many, many tremendous people. I've learned so much from them in this group. They're often very loving, well-intentioned, and people derive real benefits from being in churches and communities like this. But at the same time, there are many harmful practices and teachings that are a part of this group. So I'm not criticizing the people in the group or their character, but specifically, I want to critique the psychology and the impact of their teachings and practices. So the Assemblies of God is the world's largest Pentecostal denomination. Uh, they are massive. They have about 70 million people worldwide. They're the fourth largest denomination in the United States. And they draw their roots from the Azusa Street Revival that took place in the early 1900s. And this was a revival that emphasized speaking in tongues as the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this is based on certain passages in the Bible, especially the book of Acts, where people have this experience of speaking in tongues and it's said that they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the teaching of the Assemblies of God is that you know you've received this baptism of the Holy Spirit once you speak in tongues. It's the evidence that you've received this supernatural upgrade. There's two tiers of Christians in this teaching. There are people who have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit but are saved, and those who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And baptism of the Holy Spirit empowers people to speak in tongues, to prophesy, to dream dreams and have visions, and to evangelize, to do supernatural work. And the reason for this, they teach, is to bring back Jesus, that these people are an end times missionary movement. The Assemblies of God views themselves as an end times movement, and their mission is to evangelize the entire world. And they teach that when this happens, Jesus will come back in the second coming. He'll establish a literal 1,000 year reign. He'll destroy most of the inhabitants of the earth and he'll set up his literal kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. So the Assemblies of God really was birthed as a missionary movement. And there are several things that result from this. They're highly, highly evangelistic and conversionistic. They emphasize evangelism maybe more than anything else and church growth. Uh, so this is done at the expense of education. They tend to be really lowly educated and often anti-intellectual. Their ministers are not required to receive a master of divinity or even really to study the Bible. They claim to really emphasize the Bible, but they don't tend to know much about its roots. They haven't engaged in historical and literary criticism, uh, so they don't have much awareness of other versions of Christianity or other interpretations besides their own. They tend to just really interpret the Bible through their own dogma and to have a lack of awareness and critical engagement really of other religions and of other versions of Christianity. They are very literalistic. They interpret the creation story not as a myth. And again, they don't compare it to other similar creation stories and other religions of the same time frame but the earth was created literally in, in six days. And so they, have, they also deny evolution. They deny science, a lot of science flatly. They generally don't believe in climate change. So this 
heavy emphasis on just doing the work of evangelism because we're running out of time before the apocalypse and we need to bring back Jesus. There's an urgency that prevents people from serious intellectual inquiry and it results in a lot of trouble. And people spend a lot of time in this group run chasing after miracles and trying to discern the voice of God, the Holy Spirit's leading at the expense of critical thinking. And this can be very dangerous and very problematic uh, because a lot of people will live in a reckless way or live in a way that harms their own health and finances because they think that they're hearing the voice of God and that God will often test your faith. God will ask you to do irrational things and to not take into account your own well-being and safety sometimes as a sign of your faith. Uh, God may be testing you, God may be calling you to give it all up and go start a church somewhere or go be a missionary or even become a martyr uh, to give your own life for the sake of evangelism because so much emphasis is placed on the afterlife and just finishing this great commission of saving souls uh, rather than really critically engaging with the secular world, with scientific advancement, and asking important intellectual questions about the Bible and what people believe. There's this really an anti-intellectual trend in this group. The Assemblies of God also highly emphasizes miracles, and it will give people a lot of hype. It, it has a lot of hype about miracles and they'll constantly tell miracle stories about some missionary in a different part of the world raising people from the dead or seeing signs and wonders and healing and it has people chasing after it, praying fervently in revival services sometimes all night or just constantly asking God for supernatural empowerment and what I experienced was that these miracles were really hard to verify and that I heard a lot about them and I was taught I should believe in them but never actually saw them. And some people claim to have experienced healings and I don't even feel like I need to question whether or not miracles happen here. Uh, I think it's possible that people do have remission of disease. Uh, you can view that as a sort of a psychosomatic type thing, or maybe there's something else going on. I also don't intend to discredit that something may have happened at the Azusa Street Revival where people were claiming to receive foreign languages from God so they could go and evangelize people over the across the earth. Although it turned out when they went to these other countries that their speaking in tongues were not actually the foreign languages they needed, so they had to learn the languages. So that's a little bit discrediting in and of itself. But just suppose for the sake of argument, there were and are miracles. Uh, you know, these kinds of things happen within other religions too, and also to atheists. They'll have these sort of spontaneous remissions of, of illness or with even with psychedelic journeys, finding a psychological route to an issue. So there's all kinds of explanations. Having a so-called miracle doesn't prove the doctrine. And that's the problem. They teach people not to think, to just rely on miracles. If there's something that's extraordinary that takes place, they're not taught to question or, or think, just sort of abandon critical reasoning and just this is proof of the dogma and that all our beliefs are true just because something miraculous happened. So people also will rely on sensationalism and emotionalism. There's a lot of emotional hyping. There's a heavy emphasis on very emotional music to really get people into something of an altered state uh, where they are again relying more on this emotional experience and this urge to go be a part of this great extraordinary mission and save the world rather than really engaging their thinking critically often. And people will often use faith as a denial in a dangerous way and magical thinking is heavily encouraged. So people are taught to trust God for a miracle, to trust God for their healing, and they're often explicitly taught 
not to go to doctors, not to receive surgery. And sometimes this is not explicitly taught. Many ministers will say you should pray for miracles and also go to doctors. But the implication of being taught that you are to have faith in God is that you really should primarily do that. And if you're not getting the miracle, it's because your faith is weak and you haven't prayed hard enough. And so really going and seeking these other treatments are a lower level for people with, with less faith. It's often an implicit teaching, not always, but often. So people really can be discouraged from doing the things they need to do to take care of themselves because of this sensational thinking. And people often try to pray away their problems. Uh, this is the magical thinking. To not seriously process their emotional and psychological issues, but to just ask God to take it away. And this keeps people uh, from really getting the healing that they need, from doing the hard work of healing. Therapy is often heavily discouraged. You should only go to a Christian counselor, it's taught. Christian counselors typically just teach people mostly to focus on Bible verses, again, to focus on the promises of God, to have faith. And they integrate other things too often. But again, it's this bypassing of the healing process and taking responsibility. And people are taught also to hear God's voice. And I think it's interesting that you have to teach people to hear God's voice. And why is it that if you have this supposedly supernatural empowerment and infilling of the Holy Spirit, that you then have to train people on how to recognize God's voice? Shouldn't it be an easy, obvious thing? I mean, if God lives inside you, shouldn't this just be a natural connection that you don't have to teach anyone? But they do. They have tons of teachings on how to hear God. And this can be incredibly confusing. People chasing after this voice and mixing up their wishes and desires and fantasies with the will of God and often making very poor decisions like marrying someone who's not a good fit or moving to another country or giving up their jobs it can have a devastating impact because they believe that this is a matter of faith, that if they don't listen to that urge inside of them that they think could be God's voice, but they don't know, that that will be disobedience and it won't be moving forward in their life. And so this can be very damaging. Again, a lack of critical thinking and really integration work here. It's, it's just focusing maybe narrowly on intuition or suggestion or fantasy without engaging the other aspects of discernment. These groups also heavily emphasize spiritual realms, especially demons. They're really into demons. I mean, for a lot of Assemblies of God people, there's a demon hiding under every bush. You will see people obsessively taking authority over the devil and praying these prayers to bind the devil. They'll say, like, Satan, I bind you in Jesus' name. I command you not to harm me. Uh, they will attribute negative thoughts, including mental illness, mental health issues, to demonic oppression or any kind of addictions or uh, just normal sexual urges. They'll say that this is a demonic influence. If you have a sin in your life, if you have some area that's not in alignment with their teachings and their interpretation of the Bible, that you're literally opening yourself up. You're inviting a demon into your life and that there's this invisible force now that you're dealing with in addition to your problem. And so what they'll do is they'll have these groups, they'll call them deliverance ministries, and they'll pray over Christians, and they'll they'll cast out demons, they'll try to find these agreements and these, these areas where people have entered into sin and invited a demon into their life, or ancestral traumas where a demon could have entered in. So this can get people into this really hysterical, confused, and obsessive state where they're obsessively looking for areas of demonic oppression. And also you might have actual experiences of what seem like demonic entities. Because if you're visualizing these demons and really 
imagining or being taught that there are real presence in your life and a real threat that if you sin, you could get a demon, then it makes sense that you might have dreams about demons or see shadowy or phantom kinds of figures or be afraid of, of turning off the lights at night. And uh, people often experience sleep paralysis and they'll have some experience of having chills and seeing some kind of a phantom figure. Uh, this is something we have a scientific explanation for. Uh, but I've also found that when people leave their religion and tend to stop having these fixations on demons, they tend to stop experiencing them. So that just goes to show, like, maybe this is a lot about suggestibility. And again, I'm not even denying the possibility that a spiritual world exists here, but I'm saying there's a correlation here between obsessing over demons and actually experiencing something that could seem and feel like a demon. And again, this also keeps people from getting mental health services that they need or for, for doing the work that is required to say work through an addiction. And it's this level of fear and terror that your consciousness could be taken over by a demon. It's a really scary thing to believe. It's a really scary thing for children to believe. I mean, you already have these monsters under your bed to worry about as a kid right? The, these kinds of scary things. Now imagine this terror of being taken over by an evil spirit on top of that. It's really an unhealthy way to raise a child. So these are just a few of the issues that come with these very ungrounded supernaturalist kinds of beliefs that are not examined very critically, uh, that are not integrated with what we know about psychology and about science. And uh, people often talk a lot about demon stories as evidence that people from other religions are evil. Uh, they'll say that people, or, or also people who take psychedelics, that they see entities and other beings and that that's evidence that psychedelics are evil, or that it's evidence that shamanic rituals or any kind of a mystical, mystical practice that isn't Christian any kind of a spiritual practice that isn't Christian, they'll say that because people experience other beings or, or things that seem like other beings, that that is evidence that they're demonic and evil and that the only valid spiritual practice is whatever is taught by this cultish Assemblies of God group. And I think that's very interesting that that they would have this hardline stance against spiritual experiences, verifiable spiritual experiences that result in healing. In, empirically, we have studies about how much healing can come about through meditation, through yoga, through psychedelics. It's highly evidence. And yet, all of that is flatly denied. All of the transformation that comes from those experiences is flatly denied because it doesn't fit into their box and because these other supernatural experiences, these real supernatural type experiences, can cause people to question the teachings of the Assemblies of God. I've also found that people become disillusioned in the Assemblies of God very frequently because they don't experience the miracles that are promised, uh, that it's often all just talk and that most people, if they're honest, have not had miraculous experiences. They question whether or not speaking in tongues is a real thing because there are these services where people will train you how to speak in tongues. They'll, they'll talk in these syllables and tell you to start mimicking them. And so it's quite possible that this is sort of a behavioral thing that you're, you're learning and it, people often question, is this really a miraculous gift or is this something that I learned? And there's actually evidence too that people can speak in tongues regardless of what religion they're a part of. There's studies being done on, on speaking in tongues and that it's not necessarily even a supernatural thing. Um, but that being said, this can be very, very confusing for people and it can result in, in a lot of harm. And also it can keep people from exploring spirituality, from actually having supernatural type, or you can use a different word, mystical transformative experiences that you might have through earth-based rituals, shamanism, breath work, 
all these kinds of things that are reproducible. When you engage in these kinds of practices, there's no question whether it's real. You will have the, the visionary experiences and have the transformation, or not always transformation, but you're going to have a mystical type experience. Whereas I spent my whole life in the Assemblies of God never really having a clear mystical experience. I had some things that were emotional, some dreams that I, I questioned, is this me or is this God? Is this an emotional type thing? Is it real? When I started exploring mysticism and contemplative practices, it's undeniable, undeniable that there's something happening there. Again, whether you interpret that as just a result of the brain or evidence of some other kinds of dimensions or realms of consciousness that are real in some kind of objective way, that's not my point here. My point is that uh, the Pentecostalism doesn't even deliver the supernaturalism and the mystical experiences that it promises, and it blocks people out from exploring them because it's so dogmatic. And I think this is maybe the most ironic part of the Assemblies of God, is that it emphasizes spirituality, spiritual freedom. Uh, it emphasizes the Holy Spirit, that people should all be led by their own their own truth in a sense, their own connection to God and not by an institution. And yet it teaches the exact opposite. It's one of the most dogmatic doctrinaire organizations I've ever encountered. They're very hard line about their doctrines and they will not accept teachers who don't fall in line. And really, if you don't fall in line, you'll be ostracized. Uh, they tend not to shun people. They tend to be friendly, but they will uh, really tell you that you're sinful. They won't allow you to lead in any kind of a way, and they'll highly, heavily pressure you and even ask you to leave if you are really living in sin, they'll say, if you're not following their beliefs and practices, and if you're influencing other people, if you're leading people astray. Uh, so, in my mind, dogma and spirit don't mix at all. They're completely antithetical. If you're telling people to live freely, to follow their own way, and then you're saying, this is what you must believe, this is the way, uh, you're teaching two opposite things, and you're controlling and manipulating people to fall in line with your truth, and you're using spirit and spirituality and manipulating that in order to serve your own agenda. It's really, really warped and distorted. So even if genuine spiritual experiences happen, I think it's tragic and almost diabolical that they're being twisted to serve the aims of the institution and to warp people into a certain mold that is often not natural for them. So another big part of this is that there's really only one way to be, and people who don't fit that mold feel really isolated and shamed. So it's taught that the highest purpose for your life is to be a missionary and an evangelist, or to be in the ministry, to be a minister, and that if you're not engaging in career work that involves that, or at least giving tons of your time to it, you're a lower level of Christian. You could still be a great person and a great Christian, but you're not all out. You're not as devoted to God. Like these are the people who are the most esteemed, those who are missionaries, who are going about this great commission work. And if you're someone who's just working a regular job, so to speak, uh, then your role is to give your money and to give your time to the organization and to support these people who are doing the real, the radical work, those who are fully devoted. And this is a very hierarchical view, uh, and hierarchy is heavily emphasized in this institution, that there are two tiers of Christian. There's the lower tier, the less spiritual ones, and then the higher tiered ones who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the highest tier ones who are the missionaries and who are really going out there and converting people. So, you know, if you're someone who is more introverted and you are nervous about evangelizing and going up to strangers and praying for them for healing, you're shamed. You are, whereas someone who's very extroverted and outgoing would more naturally fit this mold and would be more highly elevated, typically. 
And if you're someone who has a different passion, say for artwork or for being a business person, and you are, are not a missionary, you're, again, you are implicitly shamed or made to feel that you are not as good and that your purpose in, say, being a business purpose is to give your money, that your passion for your business is actually not as important in the world as the work of the ministers and the people who are doing this real kingdom expanding work. So there's a lot of shame and hierarchy and really a kind of narcissism that's encouraged. So that the people who are sold out or radical, it's taught, who are giving most of their time and emotional energy to this organization are the best people. That we, the people in the church are a chosen superior spiritual race. They're special. And those who are outside of this organization, the church are evil. And often those who are just part of different Christian groups, um, evangelical Christians tend to be accepted as a lower tier, less spiritual, less woke group of people. They just don't know about the Holy Spirit or haven't experienced him. And people try to bring in evangelicals to the Pentecostal organization. But really, people who are liberal Christians are heavily ostracized. And it's funny because Pentecostals rarely have any knowledge or serious engagement of liberal Christian progressive theology. And again, most of them have never seriously studied the Bible. They've never really engaged in a historical examination of how it was constructed or questioning their own doctrines. They just demonize these other groups of Christians because they believe that if you engage in questioning or engage in other theology, you might leave the Assemblies of God and leave evangelicalism and become deceived and lose your salvation, go on to the go into the devil's camp. And that so these these Christians or these people who call themselves liberal, they're actually viewed as apostate and doing the devil's work. And some, many Assemblies of God people will view the liberal Christians as worse even than unbelievers because they teach that they're teaching doctrines of demons and leading people astray. Honestly, what liberal Christians are doing is, is trying to integrate science and study. <laughs> uh, and I think it's important to actually know the beliefs of other people you criticize. If you're going to call them demonic and devilish, you should at least be able to give an accurate summary of what they believe. And I found that almost everyone I've ever met in the Assemblies of God, I'm sure there are exceptions, don't even know seriously what the beliefs are of these other Christians or why they believe them. So again, anti-intellectualism. Uh, there's also an obsession on purpose in terms of accomplishment. And so people are taught to devote all of their time, their thoughts, their sexuality, their money, and their relationships to the church, to this organization for the purpose of saving souls, uh, for the purpose of becoming more godly in the way that the institution frames it. Uh, so people really get into the savior complex, this self-sacrificial complex that my purpose in life is not to enjoy it, not to enjoy life in the here and now, uh, not really to be myself, but to save souls, to give, to help other people, uh, to accomplish something for God, and to rack up heavenly rewards. So it's this otherworldly focus that is that results in denying of pleasure, uh, denying of being embodied in the moment, and also this fixation on the future, this fixation on what we're going to accomplish, how we're going to bring Jesus back, who we're going to save. It's not present moment. So that can create a lot of anxiety and a lot of fixation on accomplishment. And really that ha causes a lot of problems. Uh, again, it, it's this, this connection of, of accomplishment and of ambition to, to meaning in life that can be really hard to unplug from 
once you get out. And it can be really liberating for people who leave to know you don't have to save the world. In fact, viewing yourself as the savior can result in a lot of damage in itself, that people who are often the most accomplished and effective are those who are not obsessed with trying to accomplish things. They're just living in their freedom and being who they are in the world and producing out of a, a play space, a, a present moment embodied space, they're accomplishing and, and getting results, not because they feel like they have to or else people are going to die. And it's this very fear-based mentality, a very stressful approach to life. Uh, and it, it, again, it, it really is a narrow view of what purpose and meaning are. Uh, it's it's focused more on doing and achieving than being. So also this ideology, the ideology of salvation in this group is very perfectionistic. It's based on works and achievement about doing things to establish your salvation and to grow rather than an emphasis on being and uh, what's referred to in Christianity as grace. It's often a very legalistic a merit-based, meritocratic-based approach, which fits in very well with a lot of Western and American culture that doesn't tend to emphasize being as much. It tends to value people as a function of what they do rather than of just being human. Um, they teach that they do that, and to some extent they do, but it's very heavily slanted in that direction. And this can get people on a performance treadmill uh, it, it, again, results in a lot of anxiety and also degrading of others, a judgmentalism. There's a lot of judgmentalism, a lot of viewing yourself as better because you're less sinful, a lot of hypocrisy, people not being able to acknowledge their own faults because they're fixated on the sins of others and the shortcomings of others and convinced that they are very spiritual. Um, it's not very self-critical or self-aware. Uh, and it can be very prideful in that way when you see someone who has a lot of problems or I say problems with the law, you either view them as someone who's, who's in need of grace and you want to change them or someone who's inferior, uh, who is not good because they're not doing good works because they don't have as much merit. Uh, it's harder to value them as a human being, again, except as someone to be saved and, tr and converted. So these groups, uh, Pentecostal groups and the Assemblies of God in particular, uh, they use a lot of fear tactics. They focus heavily on the fear of hell. And they, I mean, this is really bad. It's really, really abusive. They often host plays called Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames, where they will depict people having this moment of choice before they die. And then it will show them burning in hell because they didn't take this opportunity to accept Jesus. And preachers will constantly teach that you never know, you could die at any moment. So they'll instill this massive fear of death and this really sense of panic in people, this survival type way of being where you always have to be worried. You're always on the edge of going to hell and you have to confess all your sins. You have to be right with God. You have to take every opportunity to evangelize, to go to church, and to confess to God, because otherwise you might lose your salvation and end up in hell. They teach explicitly that you could lose your salvation, that salvation is not assured. There's no assurance of salvation teaching in the assemblies of God. It's the belief that you have to stay right with God on the straight and narrow and you could fall out of line and there's no real way to know whether or not that's happening or people are always are taught these confusing messages that they're told that they're saved and they can take comfort in that and yet preachers are constantly saying just to be sure go up to this altar call recommit yourself to jesus pray the sinner's prayer because you know you might not know, you might be in sin or be astray and not quite know. It's better to, to be sure. So there's this constant state of questioning, am I saved? Am I good enough? Am I doing enough? Uh, and it, it, that keeps people highly motivated to evangelize and to de devote themselves to the organization. Again, so it's highly manipulative and it creates a huge sense of anxiety. Uh, people can be have PTSD from envisioning themselves burning in hell forever 
And they also feel guilty for other people not being saved. They'll feel compelled to have to present the gospel to all of their friends and neighbors because they're, they're guilted. If your friends don't convert to Jesus or don't hear the gospel message and you didn't tell them, it's your fault and God's going to judge and punish you. So this is heavy weight that's placed often on children and young adults who are just trying to find their sense of belonging and meaning in high school, being awkward, wanting to be accepted by their friends. And then they have this whole burden of having to save their whole school <laughs> and, and feeling guilty that they feel awkward and, and social anxiety. It's incredibly unhealthy uh, developmentally. And uh, it it's also taught that you are to isolate, that you should fear people who are outside the cultish organization because unbelievers could tempt you to have sex or to do drugs or to curse or just do anything that's not called godly and that could result in you going on the slippery slope and falling into sin and leaving the church losing your salvation so this is an isolationist mentality. It, it's paranoid. It views the world as threatening. The secular society is threatening. Other kinds of Christians is threatening. Uh, it's really torturous for, for kids growing up and going to secular schools. You're really taught that you have to isolate from these other people. And, and I mean, it's, it should be encouraged for people to make friends in school. But instead, they're corralled more into their church youth groups, which is this indoctrination kind of boot camp for adolescents, uh, where they really drill in the teachings of the organization into the, the young people uh, by creating this counterculture, this very extremist Christian group where they have lots of fun and social activities uh, in, in the place of really assimilating into the the surrounding culture and society so it can be very confusing people can feel a lot of rejection uh, and they're made to feel that they on the one hand they need to take responsibility for souls and get involved in the world and in their schools but only for the sake of evangelism and that they really need to guard themselves from these relationships and to go to refuel into the church youth group because otherwise they might lose their salvation. So it's this very it's very hard to have genuine relationships with people. And it's very hard to engage people to to have an open mind. Closed mindedness is taught because if you engage people, uh, if if you engage your critical thinking, you know you might have a different perspective and you could lose your salvation. So. It can keep people on a very shallow, guarded level with people who are not inside the fold. Uh, there's also a huge suspicion of the secular world and of science, again. And this really has to do with the right-wing leaning of this organization. Uh, there's a marriage between right-wing politics and Pentecostalism that's often completely unquestioning uh, except maybe for certain black churches or churches of other ethnicities because they have to actually face the inequalities and social injustices more often. But uh, there's an opposition to homosexuality, conversion therapy is practiced, uh, to really any form of healthy sexuality. Uh, it's taught that you could lose your salvation and go to hell if you have sex or if you even masturbate and abortion is heavily shamed so uh, people are taught to repress their sexuality and if they have a child because again sexual education is not taught so people have no knowledge of contraception and so then they have children and then they can't have an abortion uh, so it can create all kinds of problems for and result in people becoming single mothers just because they were, weren't were taught about sex, uh, lots of sexual repression. Uh, the Assemblies of God is very individualistic. There's no emphasis on social justice, uh, on protecting the environment, uh, not much talk conversation about race issues, again, because it tends to be so right wing. Uh, and it's also heavily patriarchal. Uh, Although women are allowed to become ministers, they're taught to submit to their husbands. 
they're taught that their place is, is mostly to raise children and to follow the men, uh, that the men are the leaders. So there are these very traditional patriarchal concepts that are reinforced. Um, there's also fear of the rapture that's taught. So it's taught that before Jesus comes back, there's going to be a moment where people are raptured. The Christians on the earth are going to be taken up into heaven and everyone else is going to be left behind, including Christians who have backslidden. They've lost their salvation. They don't know it. So people have terrifying anxiety that if they go home and their family isn't there or clothes are left out on the bed, that they were their family was taken away and they've been left behind. And people can often live in panic. Maybe I'll miss the rapture. And I'm going to be left on this earth where the Antichrist kingdom is going to be here. I'm going to be persecuted. Uh, and it's going to be this horrible, disastrous thing. So there are many other manipulations that the Assemblies of God takes part in. Uh, but leaving it can be very, very confusing. Uh, when you come out of it, you don't tend to have a place to question. You can be isolated from the group. Uh, it can be very hard to connect with secular society because you were taught to fear it. There's a huge education gap often for people, a huge gap in terms of social skills, and a lot of confusion about trusting yourself because uh, you're, you're taught not to trust yourself, but to trust the voice of God, which often means the teachings of the institution. Uh, there are so many problems that I get into more in other videos about religious trauma. Uh, but just know that if you're coming out of the Assemblies of God, that this is a huge life change, um, maybe something on the scale of losing a loved one or a divorce, and that uh, there's help available uh, and that you've you've gained freedom in a lot of ways. And so I'm Andrew Jasko. I'm the founder of lifeafterdogma.org, and I help people heal from these religious traumas, especially Pentecostals. I specialize in Pentecostalism and evangelicalism. So if you are questioning your faith or considering some other version of Christianity that's less extreme, or you've already left, I'm here. You can book an Inner Freedom Breakthrough Session for free, and we can talk about coaching for healing from religious trauma and gaining an authentic spiritual connection that suits you. So thank you. Please comment below any other experiences you've had with the Assemblies of God or any other harmful teachings that you've received.